We've talked a lot in the past few days about the ways to sharpen, add depth, and critical context to your reporting. From deepening your search for new and diverse sources of information to pushing beyond the pursuit of that shiny object. Uh, this session, I think, at least in my view, may, may be the most important part of the work that we do uh, because it's about how we do our work. And we're lucky to have uh, Kathleen Culver, the new director of the University of Wisconsin-Madison's Journalism School and director of the Center for Journalism Ethics to lead us on a discussion of the ethics guiding our craft during this especially fraught time for our industry and our country. And when the credibility of our work is on trial every day. So I want you to welcome uh, Dean Culver. She, she doesn't, she warned me not to call her Dean I'm or professor dean. or anything. I'm she wanted Katie. me to call her I'm just Katie. Katie, but I'm not sure I can <laughs> handle that. So. But we're going to depart a little bit from how we've, uh, uh, you know, sort of started out. And I'm going to start asking some questions, uh, which I'm glad to do. <laughs> I feel like I've been sitting on the sideline here a little bit. But what it, part of it is just to set the table a little bit for a discussion, I think, um, to come. And, and you guys join in. And uh, when you ask a question, stand, say who you are and where you're from and we'll, we'll launch from there. Now I mentioned the, uh, the, the dean, Katie, <laughs> just took this new job, but I'm going to ask her to take another job uh, for our benefit today. And she is the head of our little newsroom uh, as we are composed here today. Um, we don't have a name of our operation yet, but uh, we know what our mission is. But I wanna ask uh, Katie, um, what's the most important message she wants to send about how we do our work? Well, that's a tiny question. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for having me here today. It's real. I always, I always love to be around people who do the important work that you all do. And also, thank you to Kevin because I pivoted on him this morning, <laughs> saying. I just really don't want to do a whole presentation. I'd like to do more of a Q&A. So thank you very much for your flexibility. Sure. Leave it to people in journalism to be able to shift on the fly. So, um, you know, there are a couple things that I would like to say. If I were, if I were a leader of this newsroom, um, the, I think the first thing I would say about how we go about our work is to bring courage to that work. Uh, these are really hard times to be a journalist. You know, there's, there's, toxic social media, there are political leaders and other influencers attacking the work that we do. And I think it can become very easy to lose sight or very easy to get down about that so that you know the haters come to dominate. So I think one of the obligations that we have to the different publics that we serve is to bring that courage to it, to remember, I mean, I never thought of journalism as a job. I didn't do it very long. Um, I never thought of it as a job. I thought of it as a calling. Um, I think of my role in education now as a calling in the same way. Um, you wouldn't spend as many hours a day as you spend and I spend for the little amount of money that you make and I make if you didn't see it as a calling. So I think bringing that courage to the job is so important. Um, I also think, it's critically important for us all to be open. Um, one of the principal critiques of journalism ethics, or of, of journalism from those in the ethics sphere, is that we have been a pretty walled garden. We have conversations about ethics among ourselves, um, but not with the people who are affected by our decisions. And ultimately, that's what ethics is about. It's not about some code that's like written down and put up on the wall of your, of your newsroom. Um, it's about how we reason through the impact of our decisions on the people who are affected by them and how we would justify that to them. Journalism sometimes does do harm. You know, if I, if I get arrested for drunk driving, I won't. <laughs> it happens a lot in Wisconsin, but I don't do it. Um, if I got arrested for drunk driving and I'm in a position of public importance, you're going to write about that. You're going to run a story about that, and that's going to cause harm to my reputation. 
but it's a justifiable harm because of all of the other people who would be affected by that behavior of mine. Um, I just think we have not done enough um, to take that justification beyond our own inner circles, beyond that walled garden. Um, there are lots and lots of examples um, to the negative. One of the things I'm really interested in right now is AI and journalism. Um, the Associated Press, is there anybody from the AP here? Hi. <laughs> the AP, very forward thinking with its um, guidelines for how AI can be used um, within that journalism did not talk to one person outside of journalism in the development of those guidelines. It was purely internal. So um, no talking to ethicists in engineering or members of the public or people who had been duped um, by deep fakes. Uh, it was a very insular process. So while they're forward thinking on it, and I'm glad that someone is leading, um, we've got to take those conversations outward um, beyond us. And it can be very tough to engage with the public. I, I, I get that. Like I, I um, as you all know, for those of you who aren't from Wisconsin, you're in one of the bluest parts of the entire country um, in Madison and Dane County. Um, and I had the uh, distinct, not pleasure. <laughs> What's the opposite of pleasure? <laughs> Horror? <laughs> um, of uh, by who was scheduled to do, give a speech at the Madison Senior Center uh, the Friday after Election Day in 2016. And you do not want to stand in front of a room of geriatric progressives and <laughs> talk about how the news media covered Donald Trump. Like those are, I took some bullets that day. I took them for all of you. I hate Les Moonves because they were like, and Les Moonves said Donald Trump is bad for America, but good for CBS. I'm like, I'm not Les Moonves. Um, so it's, it, can be, <laughs> it can be hard to take those bullets. I get it. I, I totally get it. Um, but I think we have to do it. We've got to be, we've got to be out there. And I think um, one of the concerns that I have or when, I, when I'm talking with journalists about why you do or do not engage with the community, it's often that, that code of ethics independence thing, um, that I have to be independent so I can't serve on a community board, I can't go and engage in these ways. And I just don't, you know, I hope that that's not a barrier. I think that it's a, it's a good principle for us to remember, but we also have to remember the principles of accountability and transparency and how can we, how can we achieve those. Um, I will say there have been some good signs in that regard. I think um, places like the Kansas City Star and the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and a whole host of other um, uh, news organizations coming out of um, the protests of 2020 really began to look at the impact of their journalism on communities of color. Uh, long overdue, um, decades at least, centuries maybe, um, overdue look, but I think those were very importantly engaged public efforts. It wasn't just, I mean, they involved newsroom stuff. Let's do Kansas City Star. We're gonna do investigative journalism. Is anybody from the Kansas City Star here? No? You? You're from Kansas City. Yeah, so really super important series. They did investigative journalism on their own journalism, but they also engaged with the community. And I think um, when you're talking about ways to build credibility um, and build trust, those are really important efforts. Um, when you see those disastrous trust in news numbers, um, you know, those, you know, those like, here's, here's Watergate, and here's where we are today. When you break those down a little bit and you ask different sets of questions, you get different results. So people, Pew has a, has a um, great study that showed that when people see journalists as engaged with their communities, trust goes way up. It's well over 50%. Um, and <laughs> funny enough, how many, are any of you in broadcast? Are you work for, yeah, yeah. So, Broadcast, you get a leg up. Um, voices, uh, voices over radio or faces and voices on TV um, is automatically seen as engagement. So those of us who are in the text world, we have to work a little bit, a little bit harder on that. So those are some things I would say initially. So boss, um, in a superheated environment, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm a jerk in nature. <laughs> in a superheated environment, is objectivity possible? Objectivity is never possible. We, we are not, objectivity in a person does not exist. It's a false construct. 
we're not objective. Um, we have to try to use objective methods to get to fair reporting. Um, I think, um, you know, I'll give an example. When I worked as a, I was a police and courts reporter, and um, I worked for a time in a state that had the death penalty. And I am 100% 100 to my core, to my moral center, opposed to capital punishment. I think it's an abomination. I just, I am to my core opposed to it. So I can't be objective on that. I absolutely cannot be objective on that. I felt queasy even covering some of those cases. It just, yikes. But what I had to do was use objective methods. I had to say, okay, I recognize, I understand my own bias. I am interrogating that bias. I'm thinking about it. And then what voices do I need to have in my reporting to counteract that? I think it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a problem to say to people, we are objective, because they know we're not. <laughs> we're just not. Um, you know, we do things like, you can't wear, you can't put a political sign in your yard, but you can vote. People outside of newsrooms are like, what? <laughs> What's the ding dong difference? One is visible and one is not visible? Well, it, there's, it's a distinction without a difference. Um, and so again, having those conversations outside of newsrooms, the stuff that that people, I'll go do a talk at a library or the Madison Senior Center, and people will be like, what is this like confidential source thing, an unnamed source? Why do, like, why do you even allow that? Um, some research that a colleague and I did on um, uh, coverage, trust among communities of color. Um, she, she has a fantastic book on it. Um, she and I have one piece on it. Um, one of the things we found where it was, um, we were looking at a case where um, the, the, the Madison School District was considering, whole, considering a whole bunch of different things, including um, whether we should have Madison police presence in, in, high, school, in high schools in the district. Um, and there were some parents, um, there was one black woman that we interviewed who, a mother, um, was really opposed to this and wanted people to know that she was opposed to this. But she was, and she was willing to give an interview, but she asked that her last name not be used. She just go by her, could you please just use my first name, not my last name, um, because my son is gonna get punished. My son is gonna pay the price with his principal, who I disagree with vehemently. Um, and the reporter said no, as would most of you say, you say, I gotta have your last name, I gotta put you on the record. And so she didn't do the interview. Um, and I think those are the kinds of things that people on the outside are like, well, wait a minute, yeah, if I'm Joe Biden, you need to say Joe Biden. Um, but if I'm someone who's scared about the impact of the COVID vaccine on my kid, do you really need my last name? Now, our response to that would be, it's a, it's a credibility measure, right? If we don't use your full name, if you're not identifiable, you can get away with lying. Um, but people on the outside say, well, those practices really, really need to be thinking about those differently. So objectivity, I would say, is one where people are like, you're not objective, I'm not objective, nobody is. Now, the flip side of that, what I say to people <laughs> is bias in the news media is totally overblown. There's been a ton of academic research conducted, tons of it, and we do find some bias, but usually not that left-right binary. I call it the false binary, that left-right binary. It's news is really neutral. And so when people challenge you, you can say, you know, academic research really demonstrates the neutrality of news. To the places where it's biased, some studies show that it's really biased in favor of capitalism and corporate structure, um, as opposed to liberalism or conservatism. Um, it, so what I try to say to people is, look, <laughs> Journalism is about accountability. And so when things are going wrong, it is going, journalism will dig into what is going wrong. So it is adversarial to the negative status quo, right? It's not adversarial to the status quo, but adversarial to the negative status quo. And so really when we dig in and try to understand people's claims about biased news media, it is bias in the eye of the beholder. It's us as consumers of information rather than you as purveyors of information who are bringing the bias into it. We use all these fun things like motivated reasoning and the hostile, do you guys know what the hostile media effect is? All right, this is a beauty. 
This is crazy. So we can take the same stimulus. It's an there's a bunch of experimental research. We can take the same stimulus, a news story, and we can build it for neutrality. So it, we've got the same number of words for each speaker on, say, the left and the right. Um, and we, you know, we, we, change, we change up so the, the stimulus gets randomly sifted so that one Republican senator is saying this, one Democratic senator is saying that, and then we flip it so they do the opposite, and we put it in front of people. Um, and they will both, the receiver of the information, if they're on the left or the right, they both will see the same stimulus as hostile to their viewpoint. Just take that in for a second. So if you're a you know, Madison Senior Center liberal, you're gonna see this as biased toward the conservative side. And if you're that farmer in Outer Dade County who voted for Donald Trump, but you're still living in this Blueville, you're gonna see it as hostile to your side. It's, it's look at that liberal media bias. Whoa. <laughs> and here's the horrible kicker. The effect is more intense the more educated you are. Mm -hmm. Why? Because professors like me teach everybody in college to be professional hole pokers and, and be able to like, bring skepticism to everything. Um, and I actually have had uh, some really valuable discussions with people just talking about that. Just saying, you know, hey, we have academic research that demonstrates this. Now, the attacks on higher education and academic research um, I mean our trust numbers are going down too. But to just talk about that in community settings, if someone, you know, if, a, if an older woman calls and complains that your story was too negative, um, actually you guys aren't, you would be, you would be a state senator, um, complains that your story was too negative, you can say, you know, there's this, there's this thing we've been talking about in, in my fellows group that the bias is in the eye of the beholder. So I'm doing my best to be neutral and I'll hear you out, but I gotta present the facts as they are. So it's, it's a little tool I use to defend journalism and, and uh, say, in the same way, voters have to be responsible for who we elect. Ultimately, we're the ones who are doing this. <laughs> we are responsible for our polarization. It's the same way for the audience as well as the journalists. It's a shared obligation. Boss, we're getting a lot of <laughs> you know, negative criticism coming in over the transom. Public, uh, or actually personal criticism of our work um, to the point that it's extreme and sometimes dangerous. Um, how do we engage with, with the public and what should the rules of the road be? So uh, number one, <laughs> I, would, I would remind all of you if I'm the boss, that um, you know, ethics operates at the individual level, the choices that you all make, it, it operates at the professional level, your role as reporter, editor, producer. It also operates at the institutional level. And um, so I and our board of directors have an obligation to you. If you are receiving hateful content, if you are receiving threats, we have an obligation to make sure that you feel safe. And I am quite critical of some of the larger news organizations in this regard. Um, it's sort of, oh, that's happening to you? Sorry. No, where is the support? What organizations are doing? Uh, do, are, do any of you work for an organization where you, where you feel well supported when you are critiqued? Where are you? Uh, What's your name? What's your name? Easy. Okay. What's your name? Alex. Alex. Okay. And tell me more about why you why you feel supported in that regard. There is a group of people around who have been through this before, and they just they they kind of know how to if it, if it's a big storm, they know how to weather it, and then. If there is like critiquing about a fact or a critique about how you've written something, there are people around who have been there long enough to kind of go through the things that you're saying. Like, no, this is a fact and this is correct and this is why. And if it is wrong, you know, we'll talk about it. Be like, okay, what can we do to make sure that that doesn't happen again? And obviously, it's not like a slap on the wrist. I shouldn't have made the mistake, but it's not an end of the world type scenario. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. I came from a station, I'm broadcast local TV in Louisville, Monica Harkins, WDRB. Um, before that, I worked in Lexington and I came from a very not supportive newsroom. So I think I'm now very supportive, supported. Um, and I find that a little bit of it is 
a change in how we view mental health a little bit, like the conversation, not just for journalists. Um, and then the, also the idea of like a lot of newsrooms are starting to deal with the same traumas, right? It's, we all, I, I do general assignment and politics and I anchor. So I kind of cover all of the worlds. And when we had our mass shooting, there was an immediate response to bring in counselors. And I know that not all my peers at work took advantage of that. And that's their responsibility to take care of their own mental health, but it was my work's responsibility to provide that free service. Mm -hmm. And I took advantage of it, and it was really beneficial. And I think that that was really um, a huge change from where I was before, where my safety wasn't a priority. And then the continued um, uh, interesting topic of men versus women leaders. And you talked about like understanding your bias and understanding what are your strengths and what are your not so good parts. And I found that when we went from a male boss to a female boss, that our understanding of mental health and PTO really changed. But maybe that's my perspective of these two groups making a generalization of everyone isn't always fair. But in this instance, it was a stark contrast of how these two leaders in their genders approached our care. And I do think our assistant, assistant news director who is male has shared, I don't innately feel as sensitive as others might, and I'm gonna work better to be more sensitive as someone who is male who has accepted this about myself. So I really appreciate that and being a woman who wants some more sensitive leadership. Can I ask who owns your station? Uh, we're family owned, so it's Block Communications. Okay. Um. <laughs> they have a newspaper, so I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. We're their biggest entity, so I wouldn't be surprised if there was some not as... Okay, so I guess this is within my station, right? Yeah. Not yeah, but I was just, What above. I was saying is, um, or my, the point I was headed toward is that if, if a small family-owned company can bring in counselors, um, Nexstar can, can handle, they can pay for this, right? Gannett can pay for this. I know we're not in a great business model time, um, but they have an institutional ethical obligation to shed the past of tough it out, kid, you know, get me rewrite. That, that just, we're not in that space anymore. And we, and, and you're dealing with things now, you're, um, with social media tools and the malicious information that is out there, like the everybody sort of trying to look like news but not, isn't really doing news, it's not ethical, with all of that, this environment that we're in right now, institutions have to be supportive of those who work for them. And I think it's a damn shame that, that some of them are not. Do you have a hand up over there? Yeah. From West Virginia, one of my Dearest friends, is at the Randy University Randy with West, West Virginia, Virginia Public Broadcasting. It wasn't a direct threat, but our newsroom was just still recovering, and it was a national story on NPR and everywhere else, that uh, one of our reporters was doing an in-depth uh, look into the foster care crisis in our state. Wonderful job with it. She's a dynamite reporter, uh, but the cabinet secretary for the Department of Health and Human Resources it was good buddies with our general manager. So first, she was told that she couldn't cover anything with natural with the Department of Health and Human Resources anymore. And then when we were getting ready to do our legislative two-month uh, uh, se general session, she was denied credentials. And then finally, she was fired. And it, it created an uproar like you wouldn't believe. I mean, the Senate president came out and downgraded it. NPR did a story on it. And the rest of us, and I'm the state house reporter, and I got to go report on these people now, and these cabinet officials, and, and our GM is, is buddies with half of them, and what do you say, what don't you say, three people quit. Well, finally, they fired his ass about a month ago, thank God. <laughs> so, um, but it was, a, it was a trying time, and, yeah. and we just hunkered together, and did, could we all quit? No. Do we need the money? Do we still need the job? Yes. Uh, do what would change anything we do when it comes to calling somebody on the carpet? No, and just kind of waded through it, and we're thankfully just getting out of it now. But I mean, it's not a threat, but that exists. Yeah, is she getting her job back? No. Now that he's no, back. she's working for one of these new 
uh, nonprofits that you guys are all with, uh, making more money, getting reaching more people. And, um, <laughs> Amelia Farrell nicely, and she's the, one of the best reporters in the world. Wow. Yeah, I, I cannot tell you the number of times that I hear this from reporters, from former students and people who come to our conferences and events, that um, they know exactly what they should do, they know what is serving the public interest, and they have a leader who is not backing their play. And that it's just, it's incredibly disappointing. Um, we, we had a, a so the, our center runs um, an ethics conference um, every year. Last year was on climate change. Jack has been there. Jack is an old student of mine. Um, I used to say, it's got the best reporter name in the world, Jack Kelly. Get me rewrite. <laughs> um, but at our ethics conference last year was on climate change. By the way, April 6th this year, it's going to be on journalism and AI. It's completely free and streamed live and recorded. So it's a wonderful resource for you. Um, and it's ethics, ethics.journalism.wisc.edu. I see I should have had one slide, okay? Um, ethics.journalism.wisc.edu. But at this conference on covering climate change, I'm laughing, but it's not funny, uh, just the number of people who said, oh, because uh, the, the point that we all need to understand is that climate coverage is not for an environmental reporter only. It is every single beat in the newsroom. Your beat is the climate beat as much as an environmental reporter's beat is the climate beat. And we kept hearing from person after person after person that they, um, you know, were pitching stories like, oh, yeah, I'm on, um, uh, one person was a police and courts reporter near and dear to my heart, um, saying that they had encountered an academic study about um, how hotter temperatures contribute to more violence. Um, and that there, there was so much, there were so few trees in certain areas of their city that, you know, boy, could this actually be a story? And the editor's like, nah, <laughs> nope. Um, a number of people were really interested in climate injustice. So how, you know, it's hotter in areas of cities that tend to be poor, tend to be communities of color, um, and could not get it passed. Uh, and we're talking about some pretty big and reputable organizations. So, you know, I won't say which ones, but a half a dozen. So people like pitching to major news outlets that climate justice is something that we should care about and could not get a pitch approved until late May of 2020. And then, oh, now we actually are going to care about, how, about the ec economic disadvantages that climate change are, is presenting in indigenous communities, for instance. And so, you know, it kind of opened these eyes. So I really, I, I appreciate, how many of you are news leaders? <laughs> no one in the room? Yeah, well, I appreciate those who do it well, but we hear a lot about people who don't. Uh, I'm Haley Beemel. I'm a reporter with the USA Today Network in, uh, in Ohio. Um, Where in Ohio? I'm based in Columbus, oh. um, but yeah, we... Um, so, going back, I want to circle back to what you said about the 2016 presidential election. Mm -hmm. um, this has been, like, on my mind a lot lately because um, Ohio... <laughs> we have a presidential candidate from Ohio, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. He's not... Nothing's going to happen there. But um, he certainly has some fanboys, though. Right. And after the last presidential debate, he was getting a bunch of headlines because of he said crazy things during the debate. And so I've just been sitting here thinking, like, have not that I think there's going to be so much coverage of this guy that he becomes the nominee. Uh, but like, I'm just wondering, I've been thinking a lot about, like, have has this industry learned its lesson from the 2016 election? And I kind of think maybe not, but I'm curious your thoughts on that. It depends on how you define this industry. If you watched Meet the Press on Sunday, I think we pretty clearly have not learned a lesson um, when it comes to, um, to national television news. Um, there, are, there are ways. Uh, um, David Axelrod describes Donald Trump as um, 
the automatic weapon of disinformation, <laughs> but just everything that comes out and comes out in such rapid fire that it's impossible to fact check them. That's, that's not true. There have been some, Chris Wallace did a heck of a good job in an interview. Um, uh, Jonathan Swan, you know, kind of showed up with charts like <laughs> that. Um, and I was listening to, um, I can't remember which podcast it was, and they made a reference to, have you seen the Michael Jordan documentary? What is that thing called? Uh, Last, dance. Last Dance. Where they have an, an iPad and they show him his stuff and then he comments on it. Could you not have queued up clips of Trump saying the things that he has said um, that in an interview you say, well, that's not what you said here. You know, you now favor a 15-week abortion ban, but here is the clip of you in 20, whatever it was, 15 or 16, saying that um, you favor imprisoning women who have had abortions. Like, you, you can do it. With Ramaswamy, it's tough. The lesson that I hope we have learned um, is that just saying controversial things does not deserve a headline. Um, it doesn't deserve a story, but mostly it doesn't deserve a headline. Things that are, I call them snackable, are more easily shareable. So you're, you're in this, you know, you've got, you've got somebody within Gannett who's doing A-B testing on, on yeah, I know, you've got engagement people, and they're saying write the headline in this way, or now they're testing using AI tools to write the headline in this way, because you have to get attention. You're, you're in competition in an attention economy. Um, but if you're concerned about democracy, you should not be writing a headline, having a lead that talks about Vivek saying climate change is a hoax. This is not, and you know it's not, and that's not truthful. Um, so, um, is it Christiane Amanpour who says, I aim to be truthful, not neutral? Is that, is that how she says that? Yeah, I aim to be truthful, not neutral, which is, I, I, I'm not just going to stick it all out there and let the audience decide, because if I know it to not be true, if I know it to be problematic, um, I, I've got to be careful about how I present it. There's some um, research in political communication that suggests that we do better, if you, if you need to cover something, so when the President of the United States says something about injecting bleach, um, and you feel you need to cover that, you, have, you think that that is worth covering, um, you'd have a bit more success um, with audience understanding of the truth if you do what they call a truth sandwich. It's actually a bad metaphor because the lie is the meat of the sandwich and the truth is the bun. <laughs> um, so you, you, you say a fact, you say what the president said, and then you debunk what the president said. And so if you surround misinformation with truth, you get a little bit better gain. But I'll tell you, it's not a great gain. Um, you know, fact checking, it's, it's a wonderful movement. It doesn't have, has not had the super success that people hope it had. You met my colleague Mike Wagner the other day. Um, he is certainly a, a good person to follow. He's part of that, um, part of the group of people that does that kind of research and tries to take us forward a little bit, but we're, you know, we're not completing Hail Mary passes. We are grinding the ball down the field slowly but surely. Anybody who's ever watched the Wisconsin Badgers knows what that looks like. Yeah. Hi, I'm Clara Hendrickson. I work with the Detroit Free Press. Um, and I, I just, love Detroit. Oh, good. I was I there Detroit for the too. first time in my life last year, and that is a great American city. I agree. That Greek town is unbelievable. Yeah, it's yeah. a great okay. place. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm going back. <laughs> um, I, I would just be curious to hear your thoughts on when we should allow sources to go off the record and navigating those sorts of conversations, trying to convince them to put something on the record. Yeah, so here are some things that I would, that I would consider. The greater your level of power, the less you should be given confidentiality. It, it, it's, if you, the, the stories on, like a New York Times story, I yelled at the New York Times, like holding the paper on a Sunday morning, I'm yelling at the paper because it was the Trump administration and, and it was all palace intrigue, you know, and you knew that it was Kellyanne Conway fighting with, who was the chief of staff, the first chief of staff? I can't remember. Ryan Priebus. Ryan Priebus, thank you. Oh, Wisconsin's own. <laughs> um, 
You could tell it was the two of them fighting, but it's White House sources say. It, it, but no, there's almost no one in the White House who should get an off the record guarantee unless they're, you know, some junior level staffer who's revealing critically important information and is in you know, serious jeopardy. So the more power you have, the less confidentiality you should get. That, that's what, what I would say. Um, I would also be more likely to um, give someone confidentiality if they're at risk in some way. And I think about that risk pretty broadly. So if they are, um, uh, if they're a person whose voice has largely been silent in journalism, I would be more likely to give them that, that agreement, that off-the-record agreement. If, um, if I'm bringing in information that has otherwise been absent, then I would be more likely to do it. Um, I also think there's, there's a really great book by um, a former journalist and now academic named Ruth Palmer, and it's called Becoming the Story. Uh, it's a really great read about people who get swept up um, into the news and how, and how what that how, what that feels like and how that works. Um, it was really I I use it in classes because it was really eye opening for me and I really want my students to be thinking about the impact on the on the sources as well as the people who are consuming what we produce. Um, so I had a colleague who has now passed away who was just raged against any guarantee of confidentiality, but I think it can be, uh, it can be justifiable, particularly if it's absolutely critical information in a matter of public concern, something that's truly important to us, um, and that voice, the person is face, would face harm in some way, um, or that voice has been missing. That's, those would be the kinds of things I would consider. Did you have a, did anybody want to follow up on that one particularly? Okay, so let's go Raga and then Samantha. Oh, hold on. Hang on. Got it. And stand and yes. tell us the boss's, the boss's minion needs to <laughs> mic you up. Um, hi, I'm Raga. I'm with the Times Union in Albany, uh, New York. Um, and so what's happening right now um, is the, the migrant asylum seeker crisis, for lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there's been a lot of new people coming upstate and... Mm -hmm. um, all over New York. All over New York. Yep. We cover upstate. And so yep. the conversation has now been upstate, you know, these people, um, we don't know a ton about their backgrounds, so we don't know what exactly they're fleeing from. For example, we don't know if it's political persecution. A lot of times, like experts have told us, it might just be economic uncertainty, which isn't technically like a classified, or I mean, a, um, I don't think it's categorized mm -hmm. as like one of the most valid asylum yes. claims, even though yep. we all know that with climate change and everything, it, it's gonna become more of a thing. Um, anyway, we had a, a an email from leadership a couple of weeks ago um, after we'd been reporting on a story and had granted, you know, confidentiality to people and had used, I think, initials or we used like a first name and no last initial or something, um, which is still, you know, the people who are working at the hotels um, that are, you know, running these as sort of temporary shelters, mm -hmm. the staff there who we were writing about complaints against staff for this company that's working with the migrants, mm -hmm. we, they know these people by first name. So it's a little like it wasn't even really protecting them, I don't think. But the pushback from leadership was we should only be granting confidentiality in like the most extreme circumstances when we know for sure that these people are gonna face retribution. And it's like, well, we, don't, we don't know how to know, you know, we don't know how to know that. Um, anyway, so I was just wondering if you had any advice or guidance on how to explain to editors who aren't necessarily in the field that, um, <laughs> you know, like we, we see that they're, they're scared and we don't know what they're scared of. I don't know exactly what they're scared of and if I ask, they might not tell me, but mm -hmm. I do know that they're, they don't want their last name, they don't want any other information and they won't talk to me if I'm asking them for last name and identifiable information, you know? So there's that conflict there that I don't quite know how to, how to navigate. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how comfortable you are talking back to your bosses, um, but what, I mean, medium, medium comfort. Well, that's better than I'm sure some in the room, but, um, um, but what I advise um, when, when people call, and I get, this, I get this call, this question all the time in the immigration context. It is, I want to, I, I need to cover this, I want to cover it, I, I want these voices in here, but I can't name these people. They won't talk to me. If they, and so what I usually say is, look, 
you can't predict the potential harm, I can't predict the potential harm, um, but isn't it better under that idea that journalism ought to minimize harm, that if I predict this and you predict this won't happen, shouldn't we go my route because that minimizes the harm? And then the other thing is the journalism is better if I, if I do this, if I provide this guarantee of confidentiality the story is better. Our community is better informed. We are serving the public interest because we are getting the information out there. Um, I would really, um, uh, what was Hannah Dreyer? Uh, sorry, I just had to remember a name of like, we had a little brain fart. Did any of you read the um, story by Hannah Dreyer in the New York Times um, about child labor? Hannah is friggin' remarkable on this stuff. She's worth following, listening to, reading. Um, and she worked really hard to get people who were willing to go on the record. Um, she is featured, I'm gonna give you another resource, back at ethics.journalism.wisc.edu. There's, um, if you click on the tab for resources, there's resources for you. There's a whole bunch of interesting things there. Um, I'll come back to one in a second. Um, but included in there is this thing called the Shadid Curriculum. We run the Anthony Shadid Award for Journalism Ethics. ethics. Um, Anthony was, um, I think pretty much everybody agrees, the premier foreign correspondent of his time. Um, he died way too early in 2012 reporting on the Arab Spring. Um, and uh, we, have, we give this award. And by the way, if you, are, if you have um, been doing reporting or anybody in your shop has been doing reporting that involves some really meaty ethics concerns like yours, uh, go look up that Shadid Award and apply. Okay, it's a nice little pot of money and we fly it into New York or DC and you accept it and, and uh, we really, really like um, to, uh, we really like to celebrate the tough choices that get made and the, and the reasoning that goes into those tough choices. And it can be a really nice way to talk back to your leadership. That the way we went is the way we should have gone, and so we are finalists for a National Ethics Award. It's a nice little bit of stuff there. But, but we have five finalists every year, and we have built those finalists from the last seven or eight years into what we call the Shadid Curriculum. We built it for journalism students to be able to understand all of these people who made these tough decisions, how and why did they make them, but it's become this great resource for working journalists who are like, oh, so there's a whole section on protecting sources. Um, and you can read, Hannah was a finalist um, for some reporting she did in Venezuela. Um, and so it's, um, you see the nomination and the journalism and then an interview with the, um, with the people who did it. So it, that's a really useful curriculum. Also, another resource that's, that's at that site is um, a, one of our student fellows. Jack was also a student fellow in the Ethics Center, but it wasn't Jack. Were you, were you there with Natalie? You are? Yep. yep. So at the same time, um, wonderful student now works for the Capital Times here in Madison, um, Natalie Yar. She produced, it's called A Guide to Less Extractive Reporting. And it comes from some conversations I had had, um, actually one at a church, um, where again, you know, I'm taking your bullets, right? Um, and um, this woman said, isn't journalism basically just strip mining? I said, excuse me? <laughs> just isn't basically just strip mining? You like come in, you take what you need, and then you leave and you don't care about what happened in the environment <laughs> after you left. It's like, Wow, was that a criticism? And I was talking about it in a seminar, and Natalie was like, wow, is journalism extractive? How, when is it extractive? How does that work? And so she um, did an entire project and produced this guide to less extractive reporting. I it's the, by far the most used resource we have ever produced, and I highly, highly recommend taking a look at it. Yeah, question. Hi. Hi, uh, my name is Maya. I'm with the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the myth of objectivity. Mm -hmm. um, is there a conversation in the ethics world about? I feel as though objectivity is a tool of white supremacy and um, patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, is there discussions about reframing the lens of which we think things are objective? Yes, I would. Uh, there is a lot of conversation about that, and specifically the angle that, that you're talking about. Um, I really highly recommend work by my colleague Sue Robinson in this area. Um, she's got a new book out call, called 
how journalists engage. It's a, a theory of trust building <laughs> in journalism. Um, and uh, it's a little bit academic-y, but she's very accessible. It's not, this isn't gonna be like reading some journal article that's like these standard deviations of that, whatever. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it's a good read, I, I do recommend that. Um, yes, those conversations are out there. I'd also recommend um, um, checking out Wesley Lowry. Um, he's now, where is he teaching now? Is he where? He's freelancing now, but he's also, he's teaching somewhere. He's at American University. American University, thank you. Um, and also on our site, <laughs> you can, you can um, I did an interview with Wesley. He was a journalist in residence. And um, I did an interview, and then a student also interviewed him. And you can find that under our com conferences tab. Anyway, or our YouTube channel, it's there. Um, and we dug into that exact question for like a solid 30 minutes. Um, it, you know, who writes the rules is going to influence who is affected by the rules and how. Um, and if there is, you know, my big complaint about that false binary, that left-right bias in journalism, is that that is not the bias that's in journalism. It's just not. There are other biases that are in there. Um, and they, they come from the biases that we hold, right? I mean, when I was a police and courts reporter, this is the, this, it pains me to admit this, but so there's the, the micro level ethical decision making in journalism and then the macro. And I considered myself a very ethical reporter and I sweated those micro, micro decisions. You know, a 14-year-old um, kid charged as an adult in a double murder of his two stepbrothers. My editor's like, you have to name him. He's charged as an adult. I'm like, he is 14 years old. And doesn't the fact that Illinois is charging him as an adult, like aren't we buying into Illinois' system? And this kid was poor and this kid was black and how is that playing into all of this? Like, I mean, I was like, oh, do we name him, do we name him? I missed the macro, which is that at the time I was reporting, it was the start of and the rise of mass incarceration for minor drug offenses. I never did that story. I did stories on arrests and trials and convictions and sentences. And I didn't ever do this story about, oh my God, a dime bag of pot is taking a dad away from his kids. You know, it's a, and I really, really regret that tremendously. And one of the things I have to interrogate is, you know, my race, like my views on race. Um, the author Brian Stevenson who wrote the book Just Mercy. Anybody, has anybody read that book? Fan freaking tastic book about the death penalty. The movie isn't as good. Um, so I recommend the book. The book is incredibly instructive for journalism because he talks about how our separation, the fact that we're not proximate to each other, makes us not understand each other's lived experience. And that's, I think, I wasn't in communities that were having families lost to mass incarceration. I was not proximate to it, so I didn't see it and I didn't report on it. And that really, that really pains me quite a, bu quite a bit. Yeah, so go over here. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm making you run further. Yeah, um, I'm Blair Miller with the Daily Montana. And, um, I'm kind of curious about the sort of lens of ethics between generations. Um, I'm right smack dab in the middle of millennials. My editors are Gen X, on the, on the verge of Gen X and Boomer. And then I mentor younger journalists too and work with younger journalists. And I have seen in my career and as I've gotten older, just like, you know, what I grew up with, my values, people my age's values um, differ from people who are older. And now as I'm getting older, I see the next generation of journalists and we have different upbringings and sort of like so as like a professor and a journalist you know how do you how do you have those conversations bridge those gaps when we all have sort of fundamental biases built in for years now yeah that is so. such an excellent question um i call it the those young whippersnappers concern about journalism ethics <laughs> um, I, I gotta tell you a funny story so i <laughs> in uh june of 2020 um, within 30 minutes, I received an email from a newsroom leader saying, I cannot believe how 
how bias, how how willing our younger journalists are to demonstrate bias on social media, and within 30 minutes got an email from an employee who works for that newsroom leader. The exact same newsroom saying, you've got to give me language to talk to our leadership because they're saying that we are demonstrating bias on social media. <laughs> and you know what it was all about? Black Lives Matter and their Twitter bios. The younger were like, what do you mean? This is not a political statement. They had, you know, an ethics code and constant conversations. And I came in and do ethics training, come in and do ethics training for them. Um, and they, you know, the younger, who I agree with, you know, as a, as a Gen Xer with gray hair, I agree with them. Uh, Black Lives Matter in your, posting it, posting to Facebook or in your Twitter bio is not a political statement. It's human rights. I mean, it's just, that, it, that's that. Um, and so I think there is a tremendous tension there. I think the younger are going to prevail. I, I think there's just a, a way in which younger people are seeing journalism as a tool for positive change, where some people my age and older just really saw it as a tool for accountability, not necessarily what comes from the accountability, so those solutions. I think the, I think the solutions journalism movement is really important, and they're starting to see some research about gains that come. Do you know, are you, are you guys aware of the solutions journalism movement? So sort of, sort of. so there's this um, some research that demonstrates that if um, if news reporting on a social problem includes potential solutions, even if we don't know that those solutions will work, or you know maybe they won't work, but if it includes that, it increases people's sense of engagement and feelings of self-efficacy. Sorry, I keep hitting the mic. <laughs> um, I'm very gestury. Um, so if you if you have a story about extreme poverty and embedded in it is a new church's effort to try to start a food bank or something, that's going to make me feel, oh, um, my community can actually move forward. I am going to be more likely to vote. I'm going to be more likely to donate. So the the research is nascent, but I think it's a it's a promising movement, and I think it speaks to exactly what you're saying that some people are saying are, are thinking. Journalism is about more than just storytelling and accountability. It's about actually moving us forward. Um, that is a place where there's a line of attack, right? That sounds pretty progressive in nature, right? And, you know, I have had people say to me, oh, news media, mainstream news media, I had one guy write me saying the main street news media um, are just tools of the Democratic National Committee. <laughs> I was like, no. Um, but again, with engagement. So this guy, he called me. Um, he called me the biggest hypocrite he had ever <laughs> he had ever encountered, because I was quoted in Politico saying that um, this was when it was revealed that Michael Cohen um, was an attorney. Uh, he was an attorney for Sean Hannity, as well as Donald Trump. Um, and I was quoted in Politico saying Hannity should have just revealed that to his audience. That you know, they it's up to them to decide whether that helps or hurts his credibility. I could see his audience actually thinking it helps because he's on the inside and he knows how all this is working and he's gonna give us the real story. So this guy called me the, the queen of the hypocrites essentially. I was like, ouch, that hurts. But I responded to him and I said, I try very hard to do this and to do that and blah, blah, blah. And, um, and he responded saying, thank you so much. You really are the hope for the future. <laughs> All right, so I swung him. <laughs> so I've gone from the biggest hypocrite to our, our hope for the future. Over here. Hello, my name is Hello. Jesse Whittington. I'm a video journalist with Politico. Oh, um, <laughs> I just got a shout out. <laughs> yes, based in Washington, D.C. I'm also a professor at Georgetown University. Oh, really? Um, teaching two classes, one on video journalism and another on how to report on like race, culture, ethnicity, like those hard topics. So I completely understand what you were saying with like the young whippersnappers. They are charged up, okay? <laughs> um, so, uh, but what I've been seeing in a lot of newsrooms, which is, I think is a response to this whole, you know, quote unquote, fake news phenomena and conservatives accusing journalists of being liberal. I've been seeing that answered with a sharp turn to what I kind of think of as like a, uh, a, um, 
kind of like a like a we're going to cover conservatives in this way because they think we're liberal. So to prove to them we're not liberal, we're taking this sharp turn and giving them more coverage, more than what what would normally call for, um, different kinds of coverage. And I've been seeing that play out in a lot of newsrooms and even challenged on like some of the things that I've been reporting on, like, well, how many Republicans did you talk to? It's like, well, this is a Democratic bill. <laughs> so, you know, I'm talking to the people who wrote the bill. And so that's been a challenge because sometimes I feel like, are we doing this overcorrecting because of this critique? And I'm not really sure how to like articulate that in a way that like makes sense. And it's not even editors, it's more so like publishers, like people who own the these organizations. Mm -hmm. Um, where it's like very sometimes it's very direct, like we're not writing this story or, and so it's really hard when you're trying to do news um, because you feel like, you know, your hand is tied and then you have to be like super nice to a certain group of people because you're kind of pandering in a way. That's how I see it, but I'm not sure if, if that's along the lines of what other people are seeing. I, I think you, I think we definitely are seeing some overcorrection. Was, was it Politico that did the Lauren Boebert profile piece? Oh, yeah. And then three days later, she's kicked out of like a Broadway show. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice the musical for f vaping and fondling. Whoa! So I don't know, maybe if someone at Politico says, are you covering enough conservatives, you can just say, Lauren Bulbert. <laughs> That'll become the code, right? Um, no, I think, there, I, I think there is that distinct possibility. And again, we have to keep those conversations going um, internally and externally to make sure that we're not doing it. Um, you know, one example I would give is, um, <laughs> so in the 2016 primaries, Donald Trump would do these rallies and they would get covered by everyone under the sun. And um, I was listening to John Kasich do some really important media criticism. And he was talking about, he was, live doing a press conference. He was actually taking reporter questions and answering them as a candidate. This was when he still, it was pretty early in the race. And um, not one news outlet covered his actual press conference. Instead, at the time he was doing it, CNN had a live feed of an empty podium at a Trump rally waiting for him to arrive. And Kasich said, look, if this is what you're doing, if you're, gonna, if you're going to cover him and not cover anybody else who has anything to say, um, you're giving too much oxygen to him. And so they need to correct for that, but they can't overcorrect for that and now start giving, now start platforming, bless you, um, start you know, platforming Vivek or um, you know, everyone else. So I think there is a real danger, and I think you've got to have the kind of the courage to stand up against it, that, to say. And the other thing is, like, not every, like, stories shouldn't be both sidesy, right? Like, if you're covering a Democratic campaign event, don't put in a token conservative, you know? If you're put, like, just, if you're covering, a cons if you're covering the GOP debate, Maybe it makes sense to have you know, some response from Biden. He's not going to give it. He's nowhere near that. Maybe that makes sense. But unless it's serving the public in some meaningful way, don't do it. I'm Trisha Ahmed. I'm with the Associated Press. And I am kind of young. And <laughs> I was in journalism school in 2020 when George Floyd was killed. Mm -hmm. And um, Where'd you go to J, J school? At the University of Maryland. Okay. And I have good friends there. Yeah, Kathy Best. <laughs> What's that? Kathy Best. Um, and um, Bethany Swain, who did video yeah. journalism, um, and Raphael. Laurentine. So I'm about to ask you if you agree with the decision that they made. Okay. Um, Put me on the spot. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just curious what your thoughts are, since yeah. you were talking about Black Lives Matter and social media and young journalists <laughs> and posting. Um, so, after George Floyd was killed, a bunch of grad school students that I was in school with um, had in their Twitter bios, Black Lives Matter. And basically, our professors got scared. <laughs> and they were like, oh no, like they need to take it down. And then this 
resulted in lots of conversations um, between basically my friends and like the professors about why they needed to take it down. And my professors said, well, it alienates the people that we might report on, um, especially since it was like an investigative journalism center um, and we were talking to people who, like sources, um, in that situation who if they look us up and see that anyone has like Black Lives Matter in their bio and that source who has been victimized in a different situation might not agree with that, they might not talk to us. So given those circumstances, like I feel like I kind of get it now, but I'm wondering if you agree, if you think that makes sense. I mean, I, I understand the point that they're making. I disagree with it. And I think it's particularly pernicious, pernicious in an educational setting. I do not, as a professor, think that I should impose my viewpoint on. Also working for the investigative center. Yeah. So we're working for Marty Kaiser? No. OK. Um, sorry, a good, good friend and member of my, my board. Um, so. You're in an educational setting still. Like you're working for that center, but you are a student first. You're doing that journalism, but you are a student first. And so I should not impose, I, I can make my argument to you. I can make my argument that while you do not and I do not think that that is a political statement, um, some people see it that way. They might be less willing to talk to us. They might believe our journalism less. That's the, you know, the, the older newsroom leader who called me about that issue. That was her point, right? Like, I know that you are still objective in your methods and you are, you are being truthful in your reporting and as neutral as is warranted. I know that, but the perception out there um, is that you're not. Um, And they should, yep, they should, and that it could, and that it could hurt your career as yeah. well. Um, and they can make, they can raise those points to you. And then you can ask them questions and you can talk to other people and you can make your own decision. But I, I am not comfortable as a journalism professor saying to students that you should not have that in your, in your bio, especially given the legacy, like what we have done in journalism, like the example I gave about mass incarceration, we got some debts to pay people. And, and so like I would feel much more comfortable saying to a student, look, you've got defund the police in your Twitter bio, and that is a political statement. That is aligning with a political view, and that's a problem. I don't think I'd finish that sentence saying take it down. So with, black, with particularly the issue of Black Lives Matter, I don't think, you know, my advice to this newsroom leader was let your young reporters have their Twitter bio say that. If it moves into endorsing a candidate or endorsing a particular taxation strategy or something like that, fine, you can intervene then. But this was a very specific issue and, and everybody was super nervous and tightly wound at that time. It was like, oh, it just felt like absolutely everything was fraught. Um, but I, I mean, I take my role as an educator really, really seriously. I, I, I want them, I don't want to tell them what to think. I want to help them learn how to think and, and become critical thinkers in that way and, and ethical. And I, I, will, I will, I'm pretty, Jack, Am I pretty honest? I'm pretty honest. Um, I will tell them what I think, but I won't tell them what to do. So, I'm and thank you so <laughs> I've much. I've never heard a moderator say that before. Thank you. You're <laughs> the grim reaper of time. But you're hired in your new job. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, boss. No, thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming and sharing your time. Absolutely. Us. Appreciate it.